welcome friend. Pour your favorite cup of tea, coffee, or cocoa, and settle in for Sips from the Sip from the Utica Institute Museum. Sips from the Sip is all about sharing the history of little-known people and places in Mississippi. We're serving up truth justice with a dollop of sass. I'm your host, Jean Green. Today's episode is the fifth of a multi-part series of readings and discussions from the book, Black Man's Burden. William Henry Holtzclaw was born in 1874 and raised in rural Randolph County, Alabama, to sharecropping parents. The Tuskegee graduate founded the Utica Normal and Industrial Institute for the Training of Colored Young Men and Women in Utica, Mississippi in 1903, making it the first little Tuskegee to be established in Mississippi. The Black Man's Burden, the autobiography of William Holtzclaw, published in 1915, made him one of the first black men to publish a book in Mississippi. In Chapter 3, Holtzclaw recounts the indelible impression left on him by Tuskegee and Booker T. Washington. Let's listen. Chapter 3 But my most vivid recollections are of Dr. Washington as he appeared to me in those days. He was at that time a young man about 35 years old. He was not in any way striking in appearance, but there was a peculiarity about him that I could not understand then, nor can I understand it now. I was for a time his office boy, and I tried hard to understand him so as to be able to please him. After considerable time in his office, I learned to know his ways pretty well. At any rate, when I was ready to leave the office to go into other departments of the school, he seemed really grieved. Tuskegee was a crude place at that time compared to what it has become since. There were no local telephones, so that when a message was to be delivered from one part of the campus to another, sometimes a distance of a quarter of a mile, it had to be sent by office boy. Mr. Washington used to remark at times, where I feel sure he thought I could hear him, that I was the only boy he had found who could deliver a message quickly enough for him. This was one of his methods of encouraging boys, and it certainly did encourage me, for when I carried a message after hearing a remark like that from Mr. Washington, I always ran the whole distance to my destination and back. One thing about Mr. Washington that impressed me was his regularity. He was as regular as the clock. He appeared at his office in the morning exactly at 8 o'clock, remained until 12, very often took part in an executive council meeting until 1, and then went back to lunch. At 2 o'clock, he would again be in his office and would invariably remain there until half past 4, when he would leave and tramp across the plantation. Sometimes he would run for a mile or two as fast as he could go for exercise. When he returned, he would go to his library, and there would pass the time until six when he would go to dinner. After dinner, he played with the children for a while and then returned to his library until 8.40. He would then go to chapel for evening prayers with the whole student body. This prayer service was one that Mr. Washington seldom ever missed, and he always appeared on the rostrum exactly on the minute. Mr. Washington had a grasp of the details of the work of Tuskegee that seemed almost incredible. I remember one evening that I was startled to hear my name, together with that of one of my friends, called out by Mr. Washington from the chapel platform. He simply said, William Holtzclaw and Charles Washington may rise. I was so weak in my knees that I could scarcely stand, but I knew nothing else to do but to rise at the command of that voice. After we stood up and the whole school was looking at us, Mr. Washington simply said, These young men may pass out of the chapel and go and pick up the tools they worked with today. We had been ditching, and when the work bell rang, had left our tools where we were working, 
when they should have been carried to the tool house. If the water main or water pipe had a defect in it so that it was leaking anywhere on the grounds, Mr. Washington was almost sure to see that something was wrong and to call the matter to the attention of the superintendent of industries. If he came into the dining room when the students were eating their meals, he would notice such small details as the students pouring out more molasses on his plate than he could eat and would stop in the dining room, send for the matron, have some bread brought to the student and wait until that student had eaten all the molasses he had poured on his plate. If one walked about the campus at night, he would be sure to meet Mr. Washington almost anywhere on the grounds. For instance, he might be found in the kitchen at two o'clock in the morning, examining the method of preparing the student's breakfast. He seldom seemed to me to take sufficient rest for an average man. One thing that impressed me very much in regard to Mr. Washington's character was the way he could concentrate his mind on a subject. It seemed that when he was thinking about one thing, everything else left him. He was often completely oblivious to his surroundings. One night he came to my room and, calling me, told me to go to the barn and get him a horse and buggy at once. He went so far as to tell me that some legal matters had to be attended to. This was about 10 o'clock. In a few minutes, I had the horse and buggy at his door and drove him down to the town of Tuskegee, a mile away, to the office of a lawyer. After about an hour, he came out of the office to the buggy where I was holding the horse and told me he would not have finished his business with the lawyer for a couple of hours, and if I cared to, I could leave the horse and buggy there and walk back to the school, and he would bring them when he came. This I did while he proceeded to his conference with the lawyer. At two o'clock in the morning, he knocked again on my door and, handing me a half dollar, asked if I would not go back downtown and get the horse and buggy as he had come away and forgotten them. More than once when Dr. Washington would be dictating some very important letter to his stenographer, he would stop for a few minutes to think seriously about some phase of the matter under consideration, when he would become so oblivious of what was going on that he would forget the existence of the stenographer and would ring for me, his office boy, and tell me to send in the same stenographer that was then before him. In matters of dress, Mr. Washington was exceedingly scrupulous. He never wore any superfluous clothes, never used a cane in walking, nor did he cumber himself with anything that could, with decency, be dispensed with. But he would never wear any garment that was not immaculately clean. He changed his clothes often and was always very careful to keep his top clothes pressed properly. We students all loved him. We would do anything for him. As an illustration of our confidence in Mr. Washington, I recall that in 1898, when I was a member of the senior class, the chaplain of the Ninth Cavalry, then preparing to go to the Spanish-American War in Cuba, came by the school to get recruits. This chaplain, with the rank of captain, I believe, addressed the young men in the chapel on the subject of joining the Ninth Cavalry, and he asked Mr. Washington to say a few words. Mr. Washington, of course, was too wise to advise any of the young men to go to war, but he spoke of patriotism and of duty to one's country in a general way and left the impression that it would be a good thing for those who felt like doing so to join the Ninth Cavalry. When the meeting was over, however, a great many of us were confused. We could not decide within ourselves whether Mr. Washington really meant for us to go to war or not. So we called a meeting and discussed among ourselves whether or not Mr. Washington wished us to go to war. And every boy in the house seemed to be of one mind, and that was that Mr. Washington really meant what he had said in his talk, and that if he desired us to go and join the Ninth Cavalry, we were all ready to go. For myself, I was already convinced that Mr. Washington desired that some of us should go, 
And so I was ready to go and did go to the recruiting office in the town the next day and offered myself as a recruit. But I had been in the school eight years and my health was so poor that I could not pass the examination. Therefore, I did not have the pleasure of joining the Ninth Calvary. It was more a desire to please Mr. Washington, however, than patriotism that caused me to try to join. So anxious was I to do what I thought was Mr. Washington's wish that after I had graduated a few months later, I went to Whitesburg, Georgia, and raised a company of my own in the hope of getting it through to Cuba. But before it was drilled into shape, the war came to a close. This all goes to show what a grip Mr. Washington had on his students, and he had the same influence over the young women that he had over the young men. He was always kind and considerate. If he scolded you and you took offense at it, he would laugh at you. I have seen him administer some severe verbal punishments to students, but I never saw him in all my stay at Tuskegee become angry with any of the students, though I have often seen him try to make students believe that he was angry. I have come in contact with Mr. Washington constantly since those years, even until the present time, and I have seen very little change in him. His character as it manifested itself in those days remains the same as far as I am able to see. If he becomes excited at any time, it's always when other people are quiet. And when other people are excited, Mr. Washington is always quiet. Taken all in all, I have never seen another man who impressed me in the same way that Mr. Washington does. Tuskegee was not so large as it is now. And one man, Mr. C.W. Green, had charge of the farm, brickyard, truck farming, stock raising, and several other similar departments. For this work, he required several foremen who were appointed from among the young men that showed ability to lead the other boys. He had some peculiar ways of testing the boys. I remember that his final trial in my case was to sound my honesty in regard to money matters. One day, he went away from the school hurriedly, and while leaving, he told me to get his trousers and have them pressed for him by the time he returned. When I went to get them, I found they had a large wad of money in the pocket. I took it out carefully, counted it, and buried it in the ground in a secluded spot. When Mr. Green returned, one of the first things he wanted to know was about the money. I led him to the lonely spot and dug it up and gave it to him. His remark was, I guess you will do. There's a place I have in mind for you. The next day, he suggested to Mr. Washington that he take me out of school and make me foreman on the farm to begin with a salary of $30 a month and to have one meal daily with the teachers. If I succeeded in the work, I was to have further promotion, both in salary and in the distinction of having my three meals with the teachers, thus virtually becoming a member of the faculty. As I was still in the preparatory grades, it was with reluctance that Mr. Washington agreed to this proposition, but I was notified of the plan. After having considered it for a week, I respectfully declined to accept the offer, and I went into the printing office to begin a four-year study of that trade. I wanted to learn what was in books. I was fond of reading and of study, and printing was, and still is, very interesting to me. I carried a book with me everywhere I went, so as not to lose a second of my time. While driving my mules with a load of wood, I would read until I had reached the place of unloading. Mr. Washington took note of this, and on one occasion, while admonishing the students to make good use of their time, he said, There is a young man on the grounds who will be heard from some day." Because of his intense application to study and diligence in his work, From some of the circumstances, I knew that he was speaking of me. The fact that I might be heard from later made me double my resolutions. In September 1891, I had $100 to my credit in the treasury of the institution so that I was now ready to enter the day school 
to measure arms with the more fortunate students. But sickness overtook me, and when I emerged from the hospital after about two months of illness, my doctor's bill was $100 and my accumulated credit went to pay it. This was the penalty that I had to pay for trying to make too rapidly the transit from a lower to a higher civilization. When I lived without undergarments at home, my health was conserved because of the uniformity of my habits. At college, it had been injured because I could wear proper garments one week, but might not be able to do so the next. Moreover, Tuskegee gave me such living rooms as I had never lived in before, as hitherto I had lived in log houses, which are self-ventilating. Now I had either too much ventilation or none at all. Whenever I hear people talk about the high death rate of colored people, I cannot help recalling my own experiences, not only in the circumstances just stated, but in hundreds of others, from the time I can remember until within a few years ago. As our people emerge from a lower to a higher civilization, there is bound to be more or less falling by the wayside. It is not an easy matter to live for years in a house that has no windows, in which the only light comes through the cracks or the open door, even in the wintertime, in rain and in storm, then suddenly to find oneself the occupant of a well-built house with glass windows and other comforts, and trying to adjust oneself readily to these new conditions. I have known people who had been poor all their days to become suddenly the possessors of what to them was wealth. They would move into a good house, the first they had ever lived in, and in less than two years, several members of the family would die, and everybody would say that the good house had killed them. I used to wonder how it was that a good house could kill black folks and never affect the whites. The truth is, as I afterward learned, that even when people who have always been accustomed to wear inexpensive clothes find themselves in a position to buy woolen underwear, they very often wear the woolen underwear alternately with cotton, which of course will be disastrous to any man, whether he be black or white. This is only one of the thousand reasons why the black people in passing from a lower to a higher civilization show such a high death rate. After my illness, I went home to recuperate, but I returned to Tuskegee within a few weeks. As I had no money, I was again permitted to enter the night school and work during the day. This time, as I have said, I took up the printer's trade. Here I broke the conventional rule of acting devil for six months and began setting type after having been one month in the office. Within six months, I was one of the school's regular compositors, and within one term, I had sufficient credit with the treasurer to enter the day school. But I was not yet to enter. A letter came from my father saying, if you wish to see me again alive, I think it will be well to come at once. I went, and my father died in a few days after I reached home, June 27, 1893. All hope of future schooling seemed now at an end. My only thought was to do the best I could with the heavy load left on my hands. I pulled off my school clothes, went to the field, and finished the crop father had started. He had left a heavy debt, so I began to teach school in order to pay it. Of course, I knew little, but I taught what I did know, and I suppose some things that I did not. I think even now that I did the people in that community some good. I made them whitewash their fences and clean up their houses and premises generally, just as I had been taught to do at Tuskegee. The white people to whom belonged the huts in which the Negroes lived were much pleased at the way I taught the people to improve their surroundings, and when I was ready to go, they made me a flattering offer to remain. This was a very poor community. There was no schoolhouse except a little abandoned log cabin, which was given by a white man on condition that we fix it up. 
I could not get many people interested at first, so I took the boys whom I could interest together with a few of the girls. We made mortar of mud with which we stopped the cracks until the house was airtight, and we also made a mud ceiling. There were no windows or shutters. It was not a government school, but had to be paid for by those who sent their children. I taught three months and received in cash one dollar, but the produce I received was something wonderful. I told them I would take corn, peas, potatoes, molasses, pork, shucks, cottonseed, in fact, anything with which they wished to pay me. Wagons were secured and loaded. For several days, all sorts of provisions were hauled to my mother's house and stored away for winter. Not all the patrons, however, were willing to pay. Some would dodge me when they saw me coming with my wagons to get some produce. At one time, when I drove up to a gate and called for the man of the house, the little girl who had been one of my pupils came to the door and said, Come on, Professor. Papa is under the bed. He said, Tell him I am not in. Before I got in, however, I heard the mother say, Come out from under that old man and give this teacher some satisfaction for what he has done for your children. And by the time I got in the house, he was standing up as straight as a Sioux chief. Suffice it to say, I got two fine sides of meat from that house and a barrel of molasses. Once you get a colored man upon his feet, there is no telling what you can get out of him. I called at another woman's house to make a collection. She met me at the gate and said, Fo' God, Fessa, I ain't got a thing that I can give you. I ain't got nothing here but the cat you see behind me. If you want him, you can have him. She was eager to pay, so I accepted the cat and allowed her one dollar for it, and I turned it loose before I got out of sight. At another house where I went for a collection, the good woman looked all over the house to see what she could find to give me. There was nothing of value but a pair of scissors. She took them and forced them into my pocket against my protest, saying that I must have something for the work I had done for her children. In this way, I taught school for three years and so managed to support my mother and her family. During the winter of 1893, four, I taught in Whitesburg, Georgia, a little village on the CRC Railroad between Atlanta and Carrollton, Georgia. Here I found the Negroes still a power in Georgia politics. The Honorable Bob Sewell, the man with whom I boarded, was the boss Negro politician of that congressional district, a district that afterward became known as Congressman Adams' district. In political conventions, I have seen him have every white man in attendance, including some eminent lawyers, fought to a standstill, beaten to a frazzle, so to speak. Gradually, these white Republicans grew weary of his domination, and they began a systematic effort to eliminate the Negro from the party, or to state it in another way, they began to attempt to set up a white wing to the party. To make the matter plain, I had been appointed secretary to the Honorable Bob and was in reality at the head of the Republican Party in that district. For Uncle Bob, as I called him, could read and write with difficulty, but he was a good speaker. I wrote all his letters and newspaper articles and composed all his speeches. It always amazed me to see how much natural power he displayed in delivering these compositions. But the white Republicans kept after Uncle Bob's scalp. At length, he came to me one day and said, Secretary, something must be done. These fellows are going to beat me unless something can be done. I told him I would take the matter in hand. Our first move was to begin the fight through the columns of the local Democratic papers, for there was no Republican paper. The first article, which called forth applause and comment from 17 Democratic papers, was signed, Claude Knocker. In it, I appealed to the black Republicans to cut loose from the half-hearted white Republicans, and I showed that those who called themselves the white wing were in reality only a white feather in the wing of a Republican black bird, as the party was nine-tenths black. 
I then asked what constituted a true Republican. In answer, I quoted from General Grant's memoirs and showed clearly from General Grant's definition of a Republican that there was not a single white man in Carroll County who could be called a Republican. That article killed the white wing of the Republican Party in that county as dead as a doornail. For when the general convention met three weeks later, only one white Republican was there. The last time I heard of Carroll County, that white wing was still dead, but the black wing was also gone. Up to this time, all this tirade in the papers had been accredited to Uncle Bob, but it now leaked out that I was the culprit and I at once became popular, an honor to which I had never aspired. There now came showers of letters and invitations to write articles for county papers or to address political meetings of many kinds. I had offers of money for my influence in the campaign that elected a Democratic governor, Atkinson, but I never accepted a single dollar from anyone for such service though I wrote articles and delivered numerous addresses. All this, however, was a sort of pastime to me. I was all the while teaching school and trying to improve my meager education by study. My aspiration was to be the leading teacher in that county, for the man who held that honor could not have made the third grade in an honest examination to save himself. Nevertheless, he held a first-grade certificate. Because of my efforts to ensure honesty in the examinations, I incurred the displeasure of the leading teachers in one county in which I taught. To obtain a third-grade license in that county, all that was necessary was to pay the president of the teacher's passing club $5, and you got the license, $10, and you got the second grade, $15, and you got the first grade. It was because of my efforts to expose these methods that I lost my popularity with the teachers. How could these people write grade papers was the question. And for its answer, the good old superintendent of education in that county would have given a great deal. The examinations were taken under the inspection of himself and three other persons all with nothing to do but to see that each man took a fair examination. I have seen teachers come into the examination room with tablet and pencil who under suspicion would be placed in seats of honor in the center of the room where they would remain all day, sleeping fully half the time. They would not write more than two pages during the two days that the examination lasted, Yet when the papers would be graded, they would receive the first grade. And what is more, their papers would be excellent. How was it done? Easily enough. The principal of the city school at the county seat was president of the passing club. When the white superintendent would send to Atlanta for a tablet of some special color to be used in the examinations, the president of the club would find out where he obtained them and would proceed to get some of the same kind and hide them over at his house. After the examination would be over, the superintendent would gather up the tablets and lock them in a room of the courthouse that was provided for that purpose. Within 10 days, he and the commissioners would meet, unlock the door, and examine and grade the tablets. Meanwhile, the president of the club and his aides would have placed in their stead the others all prepared by experts. What could the superintendent do but give first grade to those persons whose papers apparently deserved it? Having secured the aid of a few teachers and ministers, I commenced a crusade against these frauds, and when I left Georgia, the practice in Carroll County was nearly stopped. But my mother still wished me to be educated. At length, she married again, for no higher reason than to permit me and the other children who were growing up to go to school. My hopes for an education were now again renewed, and I began to get ready to go back to Tuskegee, where nearly everybody had forgotten my existence. Like other politicians, however, I was without money. I went to Governor Atkinson, then Democratic Governor of Georgia, to borrow a few dollars until schools should close. 
He knew me well by reputation, and although he was himself a poor man, he readily gave me the money as a gift, and also a little kindly lecture on the advisability of staying out of politics. The good governor died shortly after that, but I have ever since followed his advice. Thank you for tuning in for Sips from the Sip. Joining me next time to discuss Chapter 3 will be Mrs. Denise Taylor. Mrs. Taylor works in the PBI division of Heinz Community College. Be sure to tune in for our discussion of Chapter 3. The Utica Institute Museum is dedicated to expanding knowledge of the history of Utica Institute and its role in Southern Black education. This program is supported by donations from our listeners. If you enjoy learning about the history of William Holtzclaw, the Utica Institute, and Mississippi, consider donating. To support Sips from the Sip and all the work at the Utica Institute Museum, visit uticainstitute.org forward slash donate. Until next time, this has been Jane Green coming to you from the heart of the Sip.